minute or two past yeah. one, our start time being one o'clock. Uh, just like to welcome everyone to the Corporate Strategic Committee meeting of 20th of September. Um, uh, and I just wonder whether we could start with um, a karakia, if uh, Councillor Lambert could help us out there. Uh, kia ora tātou. Um, well, kia karakia tātou i te ata, nei. Me, me karakia anō o te ahi ahi, e tū mai. Uh, nō reira, uh, pakataka te hau ki te uru, pakataka te hau ki te tōno. Ki a maa kine kine ki uta, ki a maa tara tara ki tai. E hia ki ana, te ata kura, e tio. Hey, Hooker, hey, how do you have my daughter? My daughter, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Charlie. Look, uh, we'll just start off. We've got online uh, Councillor Roadley, Councillor Williams, uh, Chris Dolly. You're here. Good to see you. Um, and uh, we've got, we'll take some apologies to start with. Um, we've got um, Councillor uh, Sophie's. Uh, she is. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Sears is uh, attending a, a meeting in, in Hastings, so she's uh, an apology, but she may make it um, a little later. Um, who else have we got? Councillor Van Bake. Councillor Van Bake is not here. Uh, he's an apology. Um, Councillor McIntosh. Councillor McIntosh is overseas. Um, uh, Mr. Eden, I understand, is overseas as well. Um, and who else have we got? My God. That's about it. And can I have a mover to uh, receive and accept those apologies? Thank you, Councillor Ormsby, Councillor Harding. All those, those in favour will say aye. 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 That's carried. Um, now, uh, are there any notices? There are no notices. Are there any conflicts of interest? There are none. Uh, we'll go to the... Uh, well, before going to the minutes, I'd just like to... Uh, to advise the committee that uh, we've got visitors coming in from, uh, you've got the chair of um, HBRIC to consider the report from from HBRIC, uh, and I think the chair of the port is coming along as well. Um, are there any other visitors we don't know about? Is, are the people from tourism coming? Uh, no, not. There's no one present to talk at the tourism paper today. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, all right, well, let's, let's go to the minutes of the meeting held 14 June 2023. I'm assuming you've uh, got those on your Stella. Uh, any um, uh, corrections, errors there that people know about? Uh, if not, can I have a mover to receive those minutes? Councillor Harding and Councillor Lambert, thank you. All those in favour will say aye. 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 That's carried. So uh, we'll get to the agenda, um, and it's... Um, it, it can be as comprehensive as we want, I'd suggest. Um, we've got a significant item with the, um, the um, uh, navigation safety bylaws. Um, I'm sure there'll be significant conversations, uh, Mr Chief Executive, around the carry forwards that we need to, need to review. Now, I just want to be clear on uh, where we sit with decisions of the count committee versus council decisions. So we've, we've made those corrections to... The, rec the recommendations that were formerly in the paper. So the committee is simply recommending to council, um, but we don't. We're not in need of any uh, prior uh, resolution uh, to, to be to be to be associated with any of the papers today. Uh, those, those are strictly resolu res uh, recommendations to council. Um, we've got um, the H brick. Discussion. What time are we expecting our visitors, uh, Tom? They're scheduled for 2.15. 2.15, OK. All right, well, look, we'll get going. Uh, who's going to take us through? Is that Katrina? Is that you, the uh, navigation bylaws? Um, I'll take the paper largely as read uh, for the bulk of this year uh, established in April uh, council staff set up a project team to review our navigation uh, bylaws they are um, were last or they were last updated in 2018 uh, that was a refresh 
uh, we've had significant new activity, particularly re recreational activity on the Inner Harbour and uh, Pandora Pond uh, and, um, and up in the upper reaches of the Mohaka that have a uh, team, if you'd like to come up here, that would be useful. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll just call the whole team up, shall I? And then they can answer the tough questions. Um, so we've had a, a number of new uh, and significant recreational activities uh, that this bylaw has um, sought to address. There was a significant amount of pre-consultation done on the draft uh, before it was formulated, uh, seeking the views, issues and options of our community. And all of that is before you today. Uh, again, apologies, it does need to be approved by the council and so that was the change that we made to the paper uh, yesterday. Um, any questions? More than happy to take them. Just to uh, uh, welcome Mr Harbour Master, good Sorry. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a dozen questions for you, so, uh, so good to see you. Um, are there any questions on this on this paper, this um, comprehensive overview of the, uh, the navigation laws? Have you got any <coughs> comments, Mr. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to the team that helped put the document together. Um, it's been well researched, uh, well written, and uh, very tidily presented. Um, hopefully it'll make it a lot easier for the general public to wade their way through it. Makes it look a bit more attractive than our old document. Um, so no, really, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, when we get the approval next week, uh, that it's good to go out. For, and it is a draft document. It is for public consultation. We will get feedback um, and, and maybe push back on some of the things we've asked for. Uh, but that's the process. Um, Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harding. Uh, Kia ora, Chair. Um, Kia ora, Martin. Um, did all three the Chair. I'd, Martin, you could... Um, I'm interested in these high-speed high foiling craft, so it's, it's great that we are not too far behind the curve in terms of control. The, I, I see in the consultation document anyway, it talks about restricting high-speed Oiling craft, and I'm trying to understand just how you distinguish between uh, what what that is. So, how easy is it to actually determine who's in and out of that, and how is it practical to to enforce it? I mean, I, I get I, I get the starting point is that if you have something going at say 50 kilometres an hour with a blade underneath the water, chop, it could easily chop a swimmer in half, right? Um, but but how do we get from that to something which we can actually regulate for and enforce, please? Well, we, again, it gets back to enforcing uh, a lot of the existing rules we have, and that's to have a presence there. Um, the, the Harding Road one, I think, is going to be a lot easier this year because Surf Life Saving have moved their base of operation down from uh, uh, Ocean uh, Marine Parade down to just by hot chick there. So we're going to have professional people there uh, who, who have a concern. And, and uh, uh, as I say, one of us, either Adrian or myself, is on call 24-7 um, and, and, and can be alerted and go down there. Um, the signage that we can put up um, <coughs> will also alert the general public and it has contact numbers on it. Um, we would put similar signage at Pandora Pond. Um, the ones that I find particularly frightening are the ones with the inflatable um, a wing that they hold above their head. They're really motor. Uh, and uh, I caught them a couple of times last spring um, where, the, where the optimist yachts do their training uh, through the schools through summer. Um, and it's that sort of thing that we're trying to avoid. Um, the, the Puariri residents have expressed concern, which is reflected in this document. The subdivision that's going in up on the other side of the bridge, they're concerned it will attract the jet skis and things like that that will come hurtling down the river. 
which is a really nice passive area, uh, again, for the kids to kayak and um, uh, uh, play on their, their knee boards and surfboards and things like that. So again, we're conscious uh, that uh, we want to try and prevent that happening. Uh, and again, we've got a, a very strong relationship with the local population there who will soon let us know if it's been abused. So through you, Chair, just um, ultimately, as I said at the beginning, we've done an issues and options or an issues identification through the community. Uh, so some of those issues Martin has talked about, the community have raised and asked for the bylaw to address. So that's what we're trying to do through the draft bylaw. If I just heard you correctly, you were asking about foiling. What's, how do you identify what's falling and what's not? About what's high speed and what's yeah. not. So um, uh, I might introduce you to as well while we're sitting here. Um, Adrian is our deputy harbour master. Um, I, I'm not an expert on foiling, so I'll leave it to the, both of those, perhaps to give an explanation of what's foiling and how do we de determine it. The issue is that they were in conflict with yep. the swimmers at that location. Yeah, we completely understand the issue. Yep. So you're speaking about the speed. How do you differentiate between high speed? And yeah. What is Can I speed? maybe just just to help and answer? If if we put the, the boot on the other foot. Imagine me as a recreational um, foiling sailor or foiling or a, a, an e um, sea bike, for yeah. example. How do I know whether I'm safe to occupy? What are the constraints? Is it simply yes, no, I, I have a foil, therefore I can't go there? Or so long as I operate within a low speed or a medium speed, but not high speed, I'm okay. That's an excellent question. And um, the way you phrase it is quite applicable to the reality of what we're facing. So if you're foiling, it's not possible to foil less than five knots. For the, a foil, for those who probably aren't as familiar, is essentially a blade that exists beneath the bottom of a vessel. So you can have a foil on a surfboard, um, any vessel at all, really. Um, you'll see foils in the um, sail GP, that's quite popular. So that's what the foil is, yep. right? Once you start foiling, you need to attain a certain speed, which exceeds the five knot requirement. So anybody who is transiting the area, let's say, they were passing through, we have demarcations on a special zone in which there's passive recreation. So people in there are going to be swimming, um, might be stand-up paddling, anything that's passive that is within five knots or below. Once you start exceeding that, you should be outside of those zones. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just thinking of how practically do we just communicate this to the, the public so that the public know what the expectations are when they're you know, so in the bylaw, not the, creating a problem. In the bylaw, the passive area is marked, uh, and we can mark that uh, on the water as well. Yeah. And practically say, you can't foil in this area yes. because Correct. you're going to yeah. be over five knots. Precisely. Yeah, if so you can explain boys, it in that way, fantastic. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So there are, there are certain buoyed areas where within the buoyed area, that's passive, and if you want to foil, we're not saying that people can foil or do what they want to do in the water safely, but there are zones just to ensure that where you have a multi-use multi group, people swimming, um, kids in the water, etc. we just want to ensure that there's a, a margin of safety in that regard. Does that make sense all good? Fantastic, thank cool. you. Yeah. Through, through some, of the, uh, some of our panel that prepared the document, we were introduced to a gentleman who's a foiling expert, a local guy. And, and does the kite surfing and things as well. So um, he, he educated our group uh, as w what could be done and what couldn't be done. Um, and for argument's sake, the, the Harding Road uh, beach has a, a series of boys 200 metres offshore. Uh, and uh, th that entire area to the, towards the beach is, is uh, passive. Uh, but there's no reason the foilers couldn't paddle out past there and then start foiling just on the other side of the boys. Sure. Could I just suggest that, no, that instead of talking about high-speed foiling, and that's actually doubling up and, and it's adding an element of uncertainty, so if you just talked about foiling, yeah. then that may be less confusing. It, it, I think it is described that way it in is. the bylaw. Yeah. Oh. And there is not, not in the... Not in the um, in the consult, consulting uh, document, uh, though, which is why I picked it up. As we mentioned before, though, um, foiling can be on a variety of vessels. So even a stand-up paddleboard could have a foil on the top, for example. So that's, I guess, the how we distinguish. Because if you're on a foil 
a foiling craft of some sort and you're operating on less than five knots, you're not actually breaching any of the, the, the bylaw. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. Thank you. We're also expecting foils to be, uh, we know that they're in the planning process at the moment, to be introduced on small dinghies like the optimists and things like that. So it, it's, a, it's a progressive thing. You can thank Team New Zealand for it, I think. <laughs> oh, thank thank you. You. Any uh, further questions? Councillor Ormsby, please. Uh, kia ora, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Katrina, um, Martin and Adrian for your paper and consultation document. In point 10, it talks about public consultation running for a month. Hearings will be held, is that correct? Yes. Um, the individuals wish to submit, to be heard um, in person. Um, who will hear those? If there is a need, uh, because we get submissions that want to be heard, uh, the council. So we can hold, we'll need to schedule an extraordinary meeting of the council and you will hear them uh, as the council to make the decision on the bylaw. Thank you. With a standard procedure of yeah. uh, summary of submissions, council's recommend our office's recommendations. Thank you. That's all I am, but yes, just a quick question on, on the Mohaka one. It talks about um, a speed uplifted area. What, what does that mean as opposed to a speed restriction, I suppose? A, a speed uplifted area is where we get application from different organisations, such as the local jet boat association or the jet ski association, and they ask for the five knot rule to be lifted for the day so that they can have a basically a high speed event. We just did uh, three in the last five weeks, one on the Tuki Tuki River and one or uh, two on the Tutai Kori. Um, the Jet Boat Association are a very responsible organization who cleared everything with dock and fish and game to make sure they weren't disturbing any uh, of, of the environment. Uh, and then asked, came to us and asked for the speed uplifting, which we uh, granted for a weekend event. Oh, well, take, take it off the Mohaka. We don't want anyone wrestling. <laughs> so through, through you, Chair. Uh, the reason is because the entire Mohaka is identified as a five-knot area. So on any given day, uh, no person can travel on the Mohaka greater than five knots. No, below the bridge. Below, below the, the bridge. bridge. It actually Sorry. says it's... Uh, below the bridge. Apart from those listed there... Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a speed uplifted area. Yeah, yeah. the, well, the more hack the below the bridge is speed Mohaka. uplifted. Uh, the tributaries are not. And above the Pakatutu yeah, yeah, bridge. Yeah, the more hack, that's what we say. So this is out for public consultation. We would encourage the community to certainly give us their feedback. We will do that. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Um, I just had one myself in regard to um, paragraph 15, um, just engaged with three partners, um, and I note that um, there had been a hold up or a glitch with that. Um, is there a significant engagement protocol given the spread of, of issues covered and, and different uh, rohi that are affected? Can you help us with that? Your, your, your approach to consultation. Yeah. So through you, Chair, uh, absolutely. The intention always was that we would uh, uh, engage with our Tangata Whenua partners before and uh, throughout the process. Unfortunately, uh, Cyclone Gabriel put paid to that somewhat. Uh, so while we did try in, in the early stages to engage with our, um, our treaty partners, uh, that wasn't we didn't get any feedback. And so what we have uh, going forward during the consultation phase, we are working with our Māori partnerships team. We have, uh, will be engaging with our partners, engaging their feedback directly. So just, we're not expecting, uh, we will be doing that directly. Uh, just to add to that point that Katrina just made, um, we initiated some communications with our partners in the pre-engagement stage, that phase. Um, and after that, we've sent out an email with the draft as well as the other attached documents for them to give feedback on. So that has already been done and we're awaiting um, any response and we've 
invited and welcomed any suggestions or asked if they want to have any meetings. Um, that that um, contact list was provided to us by our um, Maori partnership team. So your default position is to just put it up there. No, that's not no, that's not correct. So we have had a lot of contact with uh, Pahawera and Hineuru about the issues on the upper Mohaka directly. And so um, we've done that in in consultation with the feedback that we've had from them. And so what the team is saying is that all our PSGEs have got ahead of the public the draft bylaw for them to review, and we will be making contact with them directly to seek their feedback. So just to make it clear, uplifted means it's open, the speed limit. From the bridge? From beyond Down to the, the sea. Bridge, yeah. Yes. Be above the Pashi Tutu Bridge, from, there's from a the Apple Mohaka all the way down to the yeah. sea. From the sea, from the sea to the Pakatutu Bridge, as it stands at the moment in the 2018 bylaw, there's no speed restriction anywhere. Our proposal in here is to leave that pretty much as it is, but impose five knot speed restrictions at the campsites, as there's, there are three campsites that we're aware of until they get to the Pakatutu Bridge. When they get to the Pakatutu Bridge, the five knot speed restriction kicks in. Okay, then, yep. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, we'll um, talk about so that. from the bridge to the upper reaches. Yeah, no, well, I'm only proposed. concerned about the lower reaches. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The lower reaches, as it presently stands, there is a permanent speed uplifting. Apart from and what we're trying to establish in this one, in the revised one, is, is that we will be bringing in five knot speed restrictions. Uh, by the Glen Falls Park, uh, Everett, and the River Park, just the other side of the State Highway 5 bridge. We don't mind them rowing, they can row as fast as they like. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, um, uphill uh, rows. So, had a good coverage of that. We look forward to that um, uh, process getting underway. And again, oh, is there something on, on the board, is there? Martin. Just, just quickly, um, Mr. Chair, Martin. just on that, just on that 15 before Martin jumps in, um, just on 15 in consideration of Tangata Fenos, I just so that I'm understanding it uh, correctly, that the engagement is through our PSG. It included a mixture. Of, sorry, Chair. Sorry. Uh, from the Māori Partnerships team, we had quite an extensive list that we passed on that included PSGs and type. So, okay. Uh, Councillor Williams, you've got a um, question? Yeah, look, I um, wasn't going to ask a, a question, but I, I, I'm just um, unable to resist out of interest, understanding the difference. And if you look at uh, schedules 1.3 versus 1.4, I think it is, it's the Ahuriri Lagoon versus Hardinge Road. Uh, one refers to uh, motorised vessels, that's 1.3, and the Ahuriri one, the next one refers to powered vessels. It's out of interest, is there a difference between a powered vessel and a motorised vessel? And would the public know the difference? Uh, through you, Chair, no, there is no difference, and we'll make that amendment. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, Sorry for the pointy headed question. <laughs> uh, like those questions, Councillor Williams. Uh, uh, Councillor Harding. Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, I'd just like to take the opportunity to move, move oh, the great. I'm pleased about that. <laughs> <laughs> move the recommendations, uh, I should say. There's a recommendations to Council. Is there a seconder for that, please? Councillor Ormsby. Uh, any commentary from yourself, Councillor? Yes, Harding? just very briefly. Uh, look, thanks, everyone, who put this together. Uh, I, I think it's a great piece of work, uh, nice and proactive. Um, and I'd just say that when we come to, once we've been through the consultation period, if we can just pay the same amount of attention to communicating to the public and to the people who may inadvertently find themselves at either end of this problem, particularly around these, these new, these novel craft that are going to become much more common. So things like signage, information, yeah. Um, the better we communicate these changes, the, the simpler 
uh, Martin, your enforcement job will be. Thank you. Council, mm -hmm. um, no other comments? Uh, if not, uh, I'll put the recommendations. Uh, all those in favour will say aye. Aye. Those against will say no. That seems to be carried. Thank you so much, uh, <coughs> Mama, Master and team. Um, we now move on to agenda item six, uh, sorry, agenda item five, which is the carry forwards. Uh, and uh, we'll invite the team up, as many of those that need to come through. Uh, Andrew, are you coming forward? Anyone else? Um, Chris is looking a bit lonely there, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we better film some company. Uh, and I think you're wanting to lead out on this, uh, Mr. Pete? Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and, and through you. Um, Councillors, I think uh, it, it, in a normal year in, in uh, what I might call peacetime, um, the issue of carry forwards can be a relatively routine one. Um, in terms of uh, the paper in front of you today and your considerations, which may or not or may not finish um, with this item, um, I just wanted to set a bit of context. And for, for, for me, the context of this is uh, that the cyclone in particular um, changed what had been agreed with the community via the annual plan and the long-term plan in terms of what the organisation would deliver. So pretty much um, from February onwards, um, the organisation was focused on uh, managing the impacts of the cyclone. The consequent result of that was that a significant number of pieces of work uh, didn't get uh, addressed, completed, uh, finished, uh, and those form the basis of what sits in the carry forward paper today. Um, but there is a decision to be made about whether, uh, and in a normal year, in a, in a relatively balanced budget, um, it would be less of an issue. The challenge we have in this, or in the financial year just gone, and the financial year we're now in, uh, is that the costs of managing our way through the cyclone essentially utilised uh, the funds that would otherwise have been used to do this work. Uh, so council finds itself in the unusual position of having a deficit in its budget for the last um, financial year. So the question at a, at a kind of principled level becomes one of um, should we continue to do uh, the work that we had agreed with the community through the LTP and the annual plan that wasn't completed because of the cyclone, that comes with a funding consequence attached to it. What I would like, um, with your leave, Chair, is just to hand over to our Chief Financial Officer to kind of take you through a bit of the detail of that and perhaps then hand back to you for sure. members' questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, as Nick has said, um, in terms of a carry forward paper, it's usually a fair a bit of a formality or a, a, a required thing at a council each year. We set an annual plan for the upcoming year. Um, for the previous year where there's some of the activities that haven't been completed, the only way that we can actually get them to be completed the following year if that is needed is to go through council for an approval to carry forward unspent funds from the previous year to add them to the budget for the next year so that people are spending against an approved budget. And so that's the formality part of a carry forward paper and why it's needed in there. As part of the process of going through that paper, um, there is a lot of work done by the management accounting team working with the group managers to go through all of the areas of underspend that have been in their budgets and to rigorously assess with them what of those things actually have been underspent because we haven't delivered something that we still need to deliver, which maybe we have committed to a lot of uh, uh, an expenditure to deliver a priority for the LTP or annual plan. It may be that we have um, taken in targeted rates or, or received external specific income for a specific purpose that we would then need to carry forward to the next year. When we look at the amount that we are carrying, uh, that is requested to be carried forward here, the nine million for operating and the 3.8 million for capital, the breakdown of how that 
fund how those carry forwards have been funded in the 22-23 year is into the four areas that are mentioned in point four around three and a half million is what was debt funded so in the previous annual plan that was expected that we would draw down a loan to pay for that expenditure for those projects in there if we did not carry that forward we would not need to draw down that loan in the future there in the um, annual plan for 23-24 is already built in the interest costs for that loan drawdown in there. Um, in the, where it's from reserve funds, in some cases this can be from a targeted rate reserve, so where we have a special scheme, a, river, a small river scheme or drainage scheme, um, where ratepayers have paid into a targeted scheme, that money is set aside for that purpose. If they haven't done the specific work for that year, then we would carry forward that to the next year. There are also a number of ones that are funded from um, either accumulated depreciation reserves or, in this case, there were a number of projects that were to be funded from the long-term investment fund. And so that was in the annual long-term plan and annual plan cycle. We had said that these things, um, like the regional water security, um, and the land for life would be funded out of monies that were held in that long-term investment fund. If we did not carry that forward, we would not need to utilise that money from that long-term investment fund, and that could be utilised in other ways. Into there. Um, external funds is a third item. That is generally where we have received income from another organisation to do something specific. If we do not do that, thing, we are more than likely to have to pay back that money to that other organisation and potentially incur additional costs in terms of breaking a contract or anything like that. The final one is around general funds, and that's probably always the most contentious one. This is where we have said that out of the general rate that we have asked ratepayers to pay in the previous year or previous years, we would spend things on these items. Where we have not done that, we're asking that those general rates that have been received would be carried forward to the next year so that we could then do that work in the, in the following year. Um, in terms of our general rate, that is backed up by our accumulated funds in the balance sheet, which um, after an adjustment sits around $275 million. That has been built up over a number of years of when we actually underspend on projects that we don't carry forward to the future year that will increase that accumulated funds as we're going. What we have seen this year is because, so as Nick said, if we had not had the cyclone, we would have quite a bit of an underspend on our expenditure. We possibly wouldn't have because people would have been free to do that work, but all we would have an underspend and expenditure. That Underspend has been used up by the cyclone costs that we have done. And effectively, what we have had this in the previous year is a whole lot of expenditure on cyclone-related stuff that we haven't had much income coming in for. What we're doing with that is putting that to the Civil Defence Reserve and the Regional Disaster Damage Reserve, which puts them into deficit. In this financial year, and possibly in future financial years, given how long some of the NEMA claims take, we will start getting back insurance and NEMA claims and other funding to cover off those expenditures and start to reinstate those two reserves. It is likely that we will not get funding in for everything that we have spent. And therefore, then that becomes a decision of council as to whether we take money from a cyclone relief targeted rate or money from the general fund previously to actually reimburse those costs. So when we're looking at where we're carrying for general funds in this paper, I think it's quite important to divorce the thing of where it's funded from compared to where we would get the cash from. Um, so yes, it's funded from the general funding reserve, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we would ha actually take out loans or break managed or sell managed funds or anything to fund that. That would be a separate decision. The other thing that I just wanted to raise is that if we don't carry forward things from the general fund, um, 
we would effectively be sort of saying, you know, and if we then paid off the cyclone stuff from the general fund, we would effectively be saying, we've taken the general fund, general rates that have been accumulated over the previous year, paid for the previous year, not to do some of the things that we did do, but utilise those to pay for some of the cyclone costs. Hopefully that explains the, the categorisation that are in the columns a little bit better. Um, I think it is probably best to open up to questions about some of the individual rows and that, and we can explain in more detail if needed the funding for those particular rows, or some of the group managers can explain some of the reasons behind why that would need to be carried forward. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, appreciate um, tremendous amount of work that's been produced. It's a very clear um, picture of the, of the uh, carry forwards, but uh, nevertheless, mind-boggling and uh, for a half past one <laughs> disconsideration is pretty tough. Um, before opening it up, I just wanted to um, get some clarity. Um, it's, it's a most unusual situation to be looking forward at $9 million worth of carry forward for the air OPEX. It's a, we're in a difficult situation, obviously. Can I just ask if that uh, carry forward is, is actually factored into the, the current year's um, or in this case, the deficit. We've got a tw we're looking to run a twenty million dollar operating deficit for the coming year. Um, for the, sorry, the current year. Uh, does that include the carry for calculation of carry forward? No, because as, as I said at the start, um, this paper is to actually add these carry forwards, any approved carry forwards, to the next year's annual plan. So the annual plan doesn't include any carry forwards from the previous financial year as it stands there. In saying that, the funding for these things would be out of reserves or other income coming forward. So um, overall on the, the reserves balance, at the moment the reserves include the balance of this funding um, not having been spent other than for the except taking for the, the cyclone. Gen, except for the general rate. <laughs> it does, it, but unless you... It includes them, but then it has a big drawdown from the cyclone spend. And so that's that's the issue that we've got at the moment. <laughs> Just sorry to finish that one off. Um, uh, is Does our deficit increase from 20, 20 mil 711 to, by 2.4 mil from the general rate? Does, does that, because we're, we're running a deficit, we ran a deficit, the operating deficit would increase. The operating deficit would increase by yeah. two and a half mil. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Council <Councilor Orsley. laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm most um, concerned about uh, the general um, column for our OPEX. So we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, areas of activity that won't carry forward uh, within that general column. Could we get a small brief um, from each of the leads of staff around what uh, is involved in that carry forward? So we've got uh, environmental enhancement program. This is just to gain an understanding on what is actually going to be carried forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Environmental Enhancement Program General Rate Carry Forward is to support the um, Whakake Freshwater Improvement Fund completion, and that's predominantly the Whakake Weir. Thank you. Um, next one, Chair. Asset Management <coughs> number seven. Chris, okay. yep, I'm happy. Yep, happy to talk to that. Um, so we're only, from Asset Management, proposed one uh, carry forward. Uh, this Central and Southern Rivers flood protection uh, is community-facing funding that where we co-fund projects of community benefit. And so we put in 30% of the cost and the landowner would put in 70% of the cost. And these are things like removing <coughs> uh, trees from rivers and streams that aren't part of schemes. So it would be fair to say this is a nice to have. Um, but given the general devastation um, across uh, the region, we thought that bringing these types of funds forward uh, for access for those types of purposes was worthwhile. 
Um, and then number eight is the regional water security. Um, so that program has been uh, progressing a little bit more slowly uh, than originally envisaged, and this is our co-funding portion. So to keep those various projects alive, uh, we need to carry this um, funding forward. And I think there'll be an opportunity in the LTP to look closely at, at the relative timing of each of those um, projects which make up that program. Chris, number nine. Through you, Chair, I'm here to speak to both uh, nine and ten. Uh, they are <coughs> funding that was and is intended for the development of Kotahi, primarily to engage our Tangata Whenua partners in order to do their vision, values, and to mana or to why, as well as attributes and limit setting that we need to do with them. Now, ultimately, this work would have been done last year. We are in discussions with uh, our RPC PSG members <coughs> about contracts for this work and how they will engage uh, Taifina was uh, jointly to do that work. Uh, if the, the value of this uh, carry forward is not taken through, uh, we're currently sitting at a budget of around 800000 to undertake that work. That's including external consultants for all of the work we need to complete for our plan. And number 12. Susie, maybe? 12. There is no 12. Uh, no, but it's <coughs> Uh, the corporate software. services oh. software. Yeah, that's a, that's a debt funded item. So um, we uh, we reduced the budget in the annual plan, um, and uh, with the anticipation that we would carry forward the um, unspent funds from this year due to the the, the delays in the work program, and it, there's yeah, committed funds in there. Um, to actually deliver on the um, the software work program. Specifically, though, we want to use that uh, to ramp up activities in the Tech One space, uh, and need uh, that to support that program of work this year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the board, we've got Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And look, I I really almost don't know where to start with this, but. Where I'm coming from is what this is going to mean for our rates bills next year. And so if you just think about that as an anchor point for all of us, uh, and I, I'll try and be as brief as I can, I have been attracted to option two uh, in the sense that um, carrying forward of reserve debt and externally funded programs doesn't um, you know, it will possibly freeze up a bit of rate capacity um, in that we would be um, freer to move to to apply the rate spend or the rate burden in different ways. But I understood from Chris that in fact we've got a, t did you say, Chris, just this is the first question, did you say there was a 270 million reserve general rates or did I get the number wrong? Yeah, our accumulated funds is sitting at about $275 million, which is effectively our general funding reserve. Right. So to um, uh, Councillor Curtin's point, the fact that we might have a $20 million funding deficit this year, in other words, we spent that much more than we earned, um, if we're to carry forward this uh, $2.5 million of, of general, um, that doesn't need to come, uh, that doesn't necessarily, I mean, I, what I'm trying to align that with is the fact that we could actually pay that through the general reserve rather than adding to the deficit for this year. And so I'm left unable to understand exactly what this means for the ratepayer next year if we're to carry forward this, this general um, category of, of, of carry forwards. Are you with me? Because I'm not sure um, I fully understand this picture. Through you, Chair, in terms of the rates um, take required for next year, because these general funds would be pay the this expenditure that is being funded from general funds, that is being funded from money that is already being collected from the ratepayer, so would not actually increase future rates for the ratepayers in there. The only chance, the only things that could end up happening is 
if we, because of the cyclone, and we are spending a lot of stuff on other things, we will end up having um, either lower investments or higher debt that will potentially give us some additional interest charges or that going forward, and that would become a little a slight burden on the taxpayer, that uh, the ratepayer that way. But, right, so the implication is that we aren't able to offset what we would have spent on the, say, Kotahi or um, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the governance. Uh, we're not able to use that money to offset unforeseen cyclone expenditure um, if we do carry it forward. What would we would be doing is effectively giving us the ability to pay for those additional cyclone expenditure that we couldn't yeah. get from anywhere else from rates that we had already collected in the past. If, if we don't carry it forward. If we don't carry it forward, yes. Yeah. All right. So then, then just one last question that's been really helpful, actually. And sorry if that was all a bit jumbled. Um, but I would like uh, Katrina to paint me a picture, if she can, of what it would mean for her team um, in terms of uncertainty or otherwise, if we were to, instead of uh, carrying forward the Kotahi uh, and uh, Tangata Whenua governance funding, which is most of the general, what would that mean in terms of uncertainty, etc., relative to the other option of reprioritising all of that through next year's annual plan or long-term plan Bearing in mind that we've now got a longer runway for preparation of that plan, um, does that put you in a world of pain? Uh, where does it leave leave things from your point of view? Through you, Chair. <clears throat> we do have a longer runway, but we are significantly behind the eight ball already. Uh, we should have completed our vision values, Tamana or Tawai statements, and more already, even if we had the 2027 date, I mean, that we have now, uh, the team have considerable amounts of work to do. If we don't carry forward this funding, uh, we will simply have to work within the envelope that we have, and as I noted, that's 800,000. Uh, that is to cover all the expenses of uh, input, technical and cultural input that we need in the plan. Uh, and when you start thinking about the number of PSGs in Taifena where we have, that doesn't go very far. Uh, it will <clears throat> undoubtedly push out the work that we have to do and limit the amount of expertise that we will bring in. Um, we are looking at alternate ways of how we fund our plan development um, for the LTP, but knowing where we're headed as a region in terms of cyclone recovery, uh, that picture does not look particularly rosy. And so we need to think about uh, scaling back. And, and I don't know how we do that. Uh, I think first and foremost, it would be scaling back on planning that we're doing uh, and limiting it perhaps just to freshwater planning. Uh, but that also creates some difficulties, and I'm being completely honest with you, uh, because ultimately, even if we are talking freshwater plan, we're also talking land use and the implications on freshwater, and that's where we landed and how we got to developing Kotahi in the first instance, and a region that is chomping at the bit to do spatial planning as well, with legislation come uh, that is already telling us that we need to do spatial planning. So it, it would put us in a bind. And thank you. That's uh, the answer to the question that I was I wonder interested in. Thank you very much. I wonder if the Chief Executive could uh, help us out here too. Just as a further comment through you, Chair, um, I, I'm normally absolutely allergic to um, carrying forward operating. Uh, the reason I think that it was particularly important though that Council has a, a view across the tongue of the Whenua Partnerships and Kotahi uh, it, it is, is yes, partly we've got a plan to deliver, but more significantly for me, it's the relationship part of uh, what that funding um, helps to support. And those kind of long-term negotiations with PSGEs and Tai Whenua to support them to partner with us in the planning process, some of those will come to a head in the next 
few months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was really keenly conscious of the fact that if we've gone through a negotiation process and then we can't back up what we've negotiated, um, council is in an awkward position in terms of those long-term relationships. Uh, if it hadn't been for that and was purely about the timing of, of plan delivery, mm -hmm. we'd probably have left this operating sitting as, as not as a carry forward. Uh, but given those relationships and the importance of them to our future, I thought it was important that you, you had visibility and the chance to discuss that that issue. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harding, please. Uh, kia ora, Chair. Look, I've got two questions in there in two different directions, so maybe if we can, with your leave, I'll ask one and then the other. If you like. Uh, so the first one's uh, nice and simple, probably one that Chris uh, can answer. Reserves. Um, are all the uh, proposals to spend reserves from positive reserves or are some of these negative reserves, as in the case with CDM? Um, the, the reserves, the long-term investment fund is a positive reserve. The only one, um, and the public transport one, which is a 763, will be positive because that's income that has been received this year is going into the reserve to be spent next year. The central and southern rivers I'm not sure. Thirty three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, so we'll, we'll release that one. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. the others, as far as you you're aware, they're all in credit at the moment. And that's one. Yeah. In terms of all of the other flood protection schemes, looking down the list of them, it doesn't look like any that I know that are in deficits at the moment. Okay. Thank you. That was my first simple question. Um, and the, the next one's probably uh, is, I guess, either from Nick or Katrina or both, and it's just it's further around uh, understanding Kotahi and and whether we do or whether we don't carry forward or or part or none can't carry forward none, so we won't do that one. Um, if I've got it right, we have in our current uh, annual plan eight hundred thousand for kotahi specific work, and I'm presuming that's for external costs as opposed to staff time, but I could be wrong there. You're correct. So if we add that together with the 2.2 that we might carry forward, that's uh, $3 million. Have I got that right? 2.2 plus 8, $3 million in the current financial year on vision and values. So through you, Chair, no, not just okay. for vision and values. We're required to do a lot more work than just vision and values. Uh, as Nick indicated, we are in discussions with our um, with our treaty partners at the moment about the work that they need to do to contribute to the plan, vision, values, to mana or to wire statements, but also uh, limit setting and attribute and targets are part of uh, that, that is just the part of the freshwater plan. There is also uh, the rest of the plan that we need to do. Uh, and so that's including uh, land, uh, air, coast. So it's all of the technical expertise that we need to bring in to develop a plan, uh, which will generally in any plan development will exceed uh, Three million easily. Understand your perspective uh, and your point. Yes, are we going to spend all of that in this year? Is your question. Uh, we would hope to through all of our PSGs, but accept that that we may not. Yeah. So my starting proposition is, it's a lot of money to spend effectively, uh, where everyone has capacity constraints at the moment. So I, I, I wonder. So there's two things. One, wonder at the practical, the practicality of actually achieving that in any form of quality. I completely get that we want to go into negotiations with a full kitty so that we can deliver on our side. Um, and I think you might have answered the question that I was going to have for either you or Nick around how the relativity. So if we're talking about a pot of three million dollars for it to develop what we need to do for that plan, is that how does that compare nationally? And uh, I nationally, it's yeah, it's three unusual. tier. It's a very small amount of money to deliver uh, a plan. Uh, I can compare uh, uh, a plan that I did at another local authority that cost uh, <coughs> twice as much of, as that uh, to prepare. Having said that, uh, where was I going with this? 
Oh, I've just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Possibly capacity to do it. This oh, financial capacity. Year. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> thank, thank you. As part of our conversations with the PSGs that we're having at the moment, uh, yes, capacity uh, is a significant uh, limiting factor. However, and this goes right to the heart of our relationships, we are in discussions with each of those PSGs about having our own staff members working at place uh, up to two days a week to help write and deliver the visions and values and all of the work that the team, that the PSGs need to deliver. And, and forgive me, I say PSGs, I'm including uh, the Tai Whenua working with the PSGs on this work, so I'm not excluding Tai Whenua. It is PSGs and Tai Whenua, and that we would have our own staff who, who who at the end need to write all of this up in a plan anyway, working at place uh, to enable that to be delivered. Because ultimately we do have um, deadlines that we all need to meet. And so we're working together on that and how we might deliver them together. It's a fantastic way of looking at it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Council of, <laughs> Council of <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just feel like you're probably getting close to the recommendations, and I just wanted to point out um, something. <laughs> you might hear <laughs> there. Um, another one. Um, just, um, Chris, in the um, first table, the number 12 software corporate services of 500k is under general. And you did point out, that's um, Andrew, it was dead. Apologies, so. it's in the wrong column. Yes, yeah, so the recommendation. My totals are correct. Yeah. But yeah, we've got that in the wrong, it's in the wrong column. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you for that. I, and I, I think we are to the point of um, coming to some sort of movement. But I, I just wanted to, uh, the, the, clearly the relationships of Tangata Whenua and Kotahi are absolutely vital to us. Um, and they form the vast bulk of the general carry forward. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know whether there's a little room for discussion, examination of what that looks like, particularly just around timing. I, I have no trouble whatsoever uh, making the investment because that's what it is, um, particularly for our, our treaty partners. It's, it's, um, it's a very vital thing. Uh, is there room uh, before signing off on you know that quantum of expenditure, given that we are, you know, what's it, what, July, August, September, we've got nine months to, to deliver, um, is there scope to, to essentially look at phasing that, uh, reduce the level of carry forward, have a discussion with Tangata Whenua and say, look, um, we can't physically deliver that this side of 30 June, let's push some out and therefore um, make that sort of commitment around that. Is, is, is there scope to come back with some more detail on that? Through you, Chair, if I could maybe tackle that one with, because Katrina and I just had that, that the conversation just over over lunch. My, my suggestion would be if we, we were to go away and have a look at uh, what we think realistically will may get agreed to in terms of those partnerships in the next few months, uh, revise that figure to be focused on the partnerships across um, Māori partnerships and kōtahi, uh, and perhaps note in the recommendation when we come back to that, that should the work progress faster and further, um, officers would seek <coughs> to come back to council uh, for your consideration of a budget overspend during the year. That would mean we could reduce the size of the, uh, of the carry forward of general rate, um, but note that if the work progresses efficiently, we would come back to council to seek your permission mm. to, to carry that work on given that would have momentum. If that felt like a useful solution, um, we'd we'll be happy to come back with that um, a, as a discrete item in short. Uh, to uh, look, I'll, I will ask um, um, Thompson, Charles and Kitty uh, for a view on this in terms of it's a, it's a vital piece for Tangata Whenua. Um, it, it does require an article of faith around a commitment to spend but it's simply the timing. Uh, what, have you got a view on what that looks like from your perspective? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just want to sort of, uh, take a, a couple of steps back and, and look at some of the um, points raised by 
um, Councillor Harding, uh, in particular, just around the, uh, the cost relativity of, of being able to carry this activity out, absolutely um, support Katrina's response regarding is you know the the, the amount it's uh, it's for what it's worth it's probably nominal it's a nominal amount um, uh, because the, the 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 vital contribution that these tangata whenua partnerships um, could offer by way of being able to progress in that pace is um, <clears throat> is essential and, and in order for uh, for there not to be any more hurdles along along the way, and so it's going to take a multi collaboration of uh, what we've got here to advance those and the time frames that we've got. Our our, uh, our Māori partnerships team, our internal uh, Māori committee and RPC. It's all of those coming together, coming online at the same time, which we, we really need to be um, considerate, um, considerate of making sure that we're up, we're, we're reaching out and updating those respective parties um, at the at the right time, at the right time. Uh, I, I note in the in the previous in the previous paper where we actually. Um, where there was an, an, an effort that went out to, to communicate, to consult uh, with, with tangata, tangata Whenua and just awaiting on, on a response from Tangata Whenua. A lot's probably happened since then and we haven't sort of um, taken a multi-prong approach to it. That's my assumption at the moment. So my recommendation is that we should consider that, uh, consider what uh, Dr Nick has as suggested, and that we we carry on with this, and then at a point, if we if we think that we need to come back and, and revisit that and open those lines up again, then I think we should do so. Kenny, have you got a few? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with Thompson and um, and what's been put through from the team about what needs to happen going forward. I guess the. The only red flag that I would see amongst all of that is the point that we often come to when we're involved in long um, changes or policy and things and trying to have it with multi groups for collaboration, um, particularly multi groups that are all split up all over the place, is that by the time we get to the point of starting to get involved in those plans and having that collaboration, we're usually up against really tight deadlines by then. Um, so yeah, that would be my only fear is that if the work is pushed back a bit, that tightens the deadline again, and then how much time will we actually have for those consultative processes with Tangata Whenua and the Regional Council to actually present good plans and ones that are comprehensive and cover everything we need to cover? Because um, quite often the deadlines move up really quickly, and then we have a short time frame of four to six weeks to consult and deliver some kind of process that we want to go through or where we want to see it sit. And it's not that's not a really meaningful way to do those kind of things when you're under that sort of time pressure. Um, that would be my concern, is delays in the process. We're already behind. Um, we have been for a while. So, yeah, the, the shortness <coughs> of consultation process that happens when you push these things back is the thing that I wouldn't like to see, because that puts pressure on your team, as well as on Tangata Whenua, who don't have the resources and don't have the capacity to do these things all the time. We don't have dedicated staff to tile in any of our PSGs. And so we try to collaborate together anyway. But in doing these kind of processes, everyone has a different idea about what's good for their area or their awa or their whenua. And so bringing that together, it does take a long time. It is a lot of consultation. And it just it's hard when the consultation gets cut to about four to six weeks at the end of the project because there's a deadline to meet and presenting something, so yeah, that would be my take on it. Thank you so much for that. Um, Charlie, have you got a few? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the um, opportunity there, Neil. I, I sort of agree with the other two speakers a whole lot. Uh, I'm mindful that Kotahi is actually short for uh, the Wairo scheme, the Mohaka scheme, the Ahuriri, uh, and all the other uh, catchments that missed out on the tank. And the tank was leading up to this, taking about seven years already, and, and, and uh, so, and in the meantime, we've got this uh, freshwater statements and all the rest of it that have come out, and the uh, 
uh, the the breakdown of uh, water regulators coming in, and those have all added to the um, <coughs> the uh, the relationship um, and, and contribution by um, everybody in the district. So. Um, not just Māori, so even even the farmers have um, struggled to keep up with all the changes, uh, and, and I think the fact, one of the important ones is that to Manawa to Wai because it actually changed the whole outlook on everything. It's it's turned it on its head quite a bit, and it's put a perspective that um, our our iwi groups can really understand. Uh, so they are getting behind it. I think the fact that we have had we are in a recovery. Process certainly put a spanner in the works. I know the Mohaka plan is ready to go, and if, uh, if it that doesn't get going, but because of the lack of funding, then that's, that's our bloody fault. <coughs> Nobody else's. Uh, Wairo uh, only just started last year, and to um, to close it off now is, uh, well, you know, to tighten the strings up is a bit hard on on Wairo. Even uh, Ahu Didi, uh, and up around um, the way over the Muyang Yang. All of them um, are just getting on board. There's a lot of landowners in the middle in the interior that never participated in the tank. And yeah, thank you, um, thank you, Councillor Lambert. I, I just wonder if there's a way forward here, um, uh, Chief Executive, uh, to for, for this for com the committee simply to receive this report at this stage and for um, staff to come back with a bit of a breakdown and options, if you like. Uh, particularly on the um, on the partners, tre treaty partnership discussion, being the vast bulk of the mm. uh, is that a suitable solution that we actually push it down the road to the council meeting if we need to? Well, we, we need to we need to come to a conclusion at some point, council meeting. But we have that further detail around uh, what that entails and whether there are other options to to phase uh, phase that expenditure. Mm. Happy to do that if that's what the committee would would, would like us to do. You happy just, with that, Councillor? Yeah, I am happy. I just um, want it noted that we don't want to halter the progress of um, conversations that may, in a week or two or a month, land. So as long as that paper comes with realistic measures of where they're at and to be able to complete those uh, relationship negotiations. Yeah, I don't want that halted. Yeah. And, and just for clarity, um, through you, Chair, um, if, if we came back with the basis of this paper as it currently exists, but with some more uh, explanation and a revision of those general rate figures, is that essentially what Council would like? Because if I could do that in time for Council at the end of the month, mm -hmm. um, that means we get the item cleared up um, and you Councillors get to make their final decision. Councillor Williams, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, thank you. Just before we round this item out, the two observations. The one where I was getting to when I was fumbling around before was just getting an understanding of exactly what it is we can realistically spend next year. And I think that's really what you're, um, you've all got in mind in, in, in terms of ensuring that we don't stall anything that can realistically happen next year and should continue to happen. Um, but just having some assurance that it, it can realistically progress within um, the year we're carrying forward into. Uh, Chair, I had a couple of queries around some of the capital expenditure carry forwards. Uh, are we going to be discussing those or are we moving on to the next? Because if we are moving on. Yes, where you go. I just, um, in the current era, um, I do have, I guess, some uh, concern about carrying forward, um, you know, albeit it's small beer, uh, small beer adds up to um, large, <coughs> cumulatively, uh, funding for a new cycleway or a cycleway extension or a toilet block or a, you know, planning work for a regional park. Um, are these really the type of projects that we are um, wanting to keep aside um, funding for capital expenditure in in the in, in the in the situation where we're uh, we've got 250 million dollars worth of um, category two works to do uh, to keep people safe in their homes. So that that's just a question that I'm a little bit hesitant about those, um, and I just wanted to signal that. Uh, any any comment from Susie? I think. Possibly? I think we may have lost Chris. 
to offer the Zoom, um, Chris Dolly. I know he, he did flag to me last night that um, uh, Regional Park in particular was a question mark for him as to, <coughs> as to whether there was, um, in the current climate, value in carrying that forward. <coughs> but happy to, excuse me, happy to take forward those questions and maybe we answer them in that final paper and, and put them forward for a decision to, to council. So that, if I just got that right, there was regional parks, the, the cycleway, and, and one other councillor Williams. Sorry, I missed. Yeah, that. look, I mean, I think the toilet block's been around for a while, and there's a compelling case for it. But I'm just sort of thinking, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, yeah. when you're talking about extending a recreational cycle trail, um, really, you know, th th we do have to at least ask questions like that. I would have thought so. Just a bit more of the business case behind those items, yep. uh, in particular. Thank you. Thank you. You weren't reluctant about gravel extraction, Councillor. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> um, well, look, I think the best course of action is simply to receive the report and if staff can come back, address those issues we've talked about, uh, including an important one, um, a sort of a, a, a sober and um, parsimonious view on uh, that, that capital spend on those, whether, whether in fact you really, really need to do that. Um, if, for the coming year, can we defer that or do something else with it? Uh, so um, that's if, if you're comfortable with just uh, modifying that recommendation uh, 2.1 to simply receive the carry forward report, um, is is uh, is that acceptable to the committee? Uh, happy to move, Councillor Foley. Councillor Harding, uh, any comment? No, I just thank the staff for all the work that's gone into that. Obviously, a lot of work mm -hmm. um, coming with, with, with that report and recommendation, so thank you. Real hard yards gone in here, that's for sure. Yeah. Look, uh, I'll put that recommendation. Oh, any comment from the board, the board uh, Martin or Di? No? Um, I'll put the recommendation uh, that we receive the report. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Those against will say no, that's carried. Thanks so much, Chris and team. It's a big effort. Um, we'll move on to, I think, Susie, the debt drawdown. Um, that's agenda item six. Um, it's on page 19, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. And just a clarification on this debt drawdown paper. The recommendation that is here uh, will need to change, uh, and that is that the Corporate and Strategic uh, recommend that Council, so this paper will need to go to Council. Uh, that was an oversight from my behalf that uh, CNS can't actually approve this in total. Uh, this is merely uh, an administrative point. We saw a very similar paper come through in June uh, to the Council. Currently, under the Treasury policy at HBRC, it is only the Council that can approve new debt as we go through. Uh, what we are proposing here is that uh, the debt limit that we anticipate coming through the annual plan of 134 million, uh, that delegation to uh, enter into LGFA short-term funding to cover up to that amount uh, can be executed by the Chief Executive and myself uh, when I am returned to the role of GM Corporate Services. Um, this is a mere, I see this as a mere formality. Uh, we are staying within the the rules of the annual plan and those limits, uh, but it will allow us to immediately access any short-term funding to cover any debt as we as we go through uh, the current uh, cycle. Thank you so much. Um, has there any any questions from the committee on on this particular paper? I, I think um, Susie's explained pretty well, so I'm happy to, to move, move that. I'm happy to second. Yep, yeah, second. Move moved by Councillor Foley. Seconded by Council Ormsby. Uh, any discussion? Not. No. No comments from the floor, from the wall. No. Um, look, we'll put that recommendation. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Those against will say no. That's carried. Uh, we'll move move uh, rapidly on to agenda item um, mm -hmm. seven, the information items, uh, and this is uh, there are two uh, very similar papers coming forward: the annual report and the organisation report for the fourth quarter. Uh, obviously, a significant overlay of the, both of those reports, but um, we'll take one at a time, uh, because I think we need to. Uh, and this is um, uh, the non-financial part of the report, because we're not ready to give you the numbers uh, for the financials. Uh, so, Sarah, can you 
Mm. Take us away with uh, what you want to achieve today. Sure. Um, oh, and I'll take the paper as read. Um, we historically bring these to you to review because we've got quite a short way for approval for the annual report this time. So this is probably your first and only time to see them before they get adopted. Um, and I do want to point out that um, um, we, we do have our auditors on site next week. So all of this information goes to them as well as all the financial information. And just speaking with the financial team, um, we, were, we are planning, uh, planning to bring the draft financial statements and community outcomes um, to review by council at a briefing session on the 11th of October. So you will get to see them in a draft form before they get adopted as well, as well as the financial information. Um, and I just also just want to point out that our auditors, um, Ernst and Young, will present the preliminary audit findings to the Risk and Audit Committee on the 18th of October. So although we've got a short runway, we've hopefully pegged in enough um, milestones for, for um, our governors to be across um, what information is going to be in the annual report. So the, the, the part that I've um, tabled today is largely around our group of activities and how we've measured our levels of service, um, uh, level of service measures. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Sarah. Um, somewhat of a um, sea of red in some respects, which uh, is totally explicable. But um, uh, any questions from uh, from uh, for anyone on that? Um, Katrina's not here. I did have one. Is, that, is Katrina over there? She is. So. She's here. <laughs> um, Katrina, I just had a question in regard to the performance measure uh, around um, the consents monitored. Uh, falling away to 62%. Uh, the question is, it's totally understandable why, but is it, is it of, um, uh, is it, how, how significant and important is it that we um, move back up to uh, a higher number? It, it, does it have consequences for, for, for that level, low level of, of uh, monitoring? Uh, through you, Tia, I don't think it has significant consequences. Uh, but there are cons there are some. So uh, if we're not monitoring, then it reduces the monitoring income, first and foremost. So that's a small consequence. Uh, so it reduces uh, the team's ability to hit their recoveries that they're in terms of the uh, uh, financing revenue and financing requirement. So that's a small consequence. Uh, and, but secondly, it's about ensuring people are meeting their consent requirements, uh, given the environment that we're currently in, in recovery. Uh, most consent holders and landowners are doing their best endeavours, uh, and so we are working with them anyway, if not um, to, to monitor their consents, but actually to work with them on recovery. We will get back. Uh, to a reasonable level of, of uh, recovery in the coming year, I would expect. But there's a certain amount of leeway given the situation. There is, yeah. yeah. All right, any other questions or comment? Councillor Harding. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am looking at page, what's the uh, report, page 40, our page 18, uh, corporate uh, CO2, what's, what are the term? Corporate emissions, mm -hmm. and my question is, uh, and, and the report notes that uh, what's being measured is scope one to three, so that's direct and indirect, excluding employee commuting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a few other things. My question is whether this year's figure includes our the task force uh, carbon footprint, the silt task force carbon footprint. I suspect it doesn't um, because I think the graph would be much taller and my concern would be that um, if we're not counting it, who is? And I'm not sure that it's, if we are representing scope one to three uh, with those exclusions noted, but we don't have the task force carbon footprint, which I think will be massive with the amount of trucking going on, then we are not representing the position appropriately. So can I leave that to staff to delve into, please? Um, I, this has only just gone to the auditors. I'd be really interested to see what the auditors 
come back and ask if they ask the same question as well, so we can mm. follow that up. Yeah, I just, I, I'm just interested. Yeah, that uh, that is a great, that great question. Uh, that is a great question, Councillor Harding, around. Uh, the measure is our own carbon footprint, uh, and how would we, if we are going to factor in the task force, how would we then factor in all of our third-party consultant mm -hmm. contractor footprint? And I don't think the intent of that measure is to measure that. However, I will come back with clarity on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ormsby. Yeah, sorry, just to add to that, got me thinking. Um, I think that that would be a useful conversation of how wide we extend that from the current position. Because um, I know we've excluded our bus service. Yep. Right or wrong reason, but I think we need to re-look uh, at what is actually included in that. So when would be a appropriate time to do that? There are often, um, through your chair, there are often standards for, for measuring carbon emissions. And um, those standards will differ in different sets of standards, sometimes with third parties, buses, contractors, and so on. They, those standards will employ a specific measure that says those are excluded because they're not in, within the control of your organisation. And those are the emissions of those companies. So go buses emissions or um, contractor X's emissions. Um, and so you shouldn't count them in terms of your one, but other there are other standards that, that incorporate them, and it's a decision for council. I think the thing we could usually do as officers is go away and say, have we got a set of um, common accounting standards applied to CO2 emissions? And be clear what those common accounting standards are and bring that back to you um, at some point. Um, and I think ask our climate change experts, um, Pippa and co, what, what they look like. Thank you, Sarah. It's, uh, any other questions from the floor? From the wall, from the floor, Di, uh, Martin, nothing from you? Okay. Look, uh, say again. Martin, have you got a, your hand up there? Or is that a no, red? Chair, I'm just wondering uh, procedurally is, if there's an issue for this committee if I actually withdraw from the meeting at this point. I'm not sure that I can add a lot more value to it, and I'm feeling pretty fatigued. I think we've got a quorum, Martin, so I think you'd be pretty pretty right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, look, can I have a mover for uh, to receive the report, please, the um, interim financial results? Councillor Harding and Councillor Hockey Engler. Uh, any, any comment from either of you? Uh, anyone else? Uh, if not, I'll put the, uh, the recommendation that we receive the report. All those in favour will say aye. aye. Those that are against will say, will say no. Uh, that's carried. Uh, look, with your indulgence, uh, committee members, uh, I wonder whether I could ask to skip to agenda item 10, which is the uh, HBRIC uh, quarterly update. We've got uh, our visitors here. Uh, if you're with your, your consent, if we could move to that item now. Is that acceptable to people where we do that while they're here and move them, move them on as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Dan Drizianic here and Blair, welcome. Would you like to come forward as well? Oh, You're happy to uh, <laughs> take a seat. Tom, uh, Mr Skirman, can you please come to the front, please? Very Thank good you. to see you, Dan. Thank Thanks you, Chair. For and, uh, taking the time to come today. I just wondered whether you could uh, oh. get hold, have a, have a bit of a comment on uh, on your report, and uh, see where we go. Thank you, Chair, and Kiora, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to um, you know just acknowledge that post cyclone, we, as your subsidiary investment company, understand the uh, financial uh, challenges that you know are, are going on um, with the rebuild. So we're very conscious of that uh, in our dealings. Uh, so today's quarterly report is actually our fourth report for the year. So it's sort of our annual um, audited uh, figures, which we've got in front of you. In the last quarter, we've been um, quite busy uh, dealing with uh, reshaping boards. So we welcome two new independent um, directors onto the HBRIC board, which the council appointed through their committee, subcommittee panel. 
Uh, and yeah, I'm pleased to say, you know, they're very impressive um, candidates. Um, Debbie Birch has um, got a lot of experience in uh, the financial markets and will add a lot of value in terms of our uh, managed funds, uh, strategies around managed funds. And Jonathan Cameron has sort of got an investment banking background and um, you know a lot of experience in that those matters. Both of them have got um, you know a lot of experience in um, iwi um, relationships and uh, trust investments trusts around the country. Uh, talking about managed funds, uh, over the year um, the managed funds have come back on track, so we've got a 2.5 million dollar increase in um, in those funds, that total funds, which represents a 5.6% return. Uh, this time last year we were, you know, we we do acknowledge that the SIPO, which has which sort of been written by the council, does need reviewing, and there were some concerns a few months ago that it was um, too conservative to get the returns that we were needing for the future. So that, that remains a uh, a review item um, post, uh, you know, uh, this investment strategy review. But in the meantime, good news is that the uh, markets have um, turned into the right, turned into the right direction, and the uh, the capital that um, came out of the port IPO is you know, remains intact. So. Uh, be it that it's sort of been invested conservatively at this point. Uh, food East, uh, that's our limited partnership in the Food Innovation Hub in Hastings. Uh, that's also on track. Uh, we have uh, reshaped the board um, to bring on a, uh, a lot of food industry talent and experience. So we've got three new board members, uh, all from the food industry. Uh, they, they will be starting um, later this month and um, we'd like to acknowledge uh, and thank Craig Foss who has made a cons significant contribution to this project as, and he's an ex as an ex-councillor he's going to be stepping, stepping aside at the AGM uh, in a few weeks time. That project is due to go live in March, open for um, as a food hub. March 24. So um, we've sort of, it's sort of moving from a construction phase to an operation phase. So they're, they're uh, busy out there finding tenants for the for the spaces and um, recruiting the team that they need to uh, d to deliver the uh, innovation um, services. Uh, that brings us to the port. Uh, the port's our biggest investment. Uh, and, you know, obviously there's been significant challenges post-cyclone uh, on customers, roads and access by rail to the port. As you know, the rail line is now open. Uh, but I have, um, so that has affected, uh, it affected our June dividend, uh, which was down by, from the port, which was down by 40%, half-year dividend. Uh, yeah, and so um, I've got uh, Blair O'Keefe has kindly uh, come along today as to to uh, represent the port. But um, the port is, you know, uh, really a mirror of what's going on in Hawke's Bay. So um, we're not immune to the. It's basically a volume volume story, trade volume story. And with the uh, damage to crops and roads and the ability to get logs and to the port, it's uh, been temporarily uh, uh, affected. Um, not sure if you want to add anything, Blair, at this point? No, I think that probably sums it up nicely, Dan. It's, I guess the headline would be if we were entered into the start of the year looking to deliver uh, towards the top end of our guidance for profitability. So we were off to a really good start. And then uh, the cyclone came along and uh, obviously the balloons out of the sales substantially. And for the year, for us, this is our peak debt year on the back of uh, the uh, Tiffany Wharf uh, investment. Uh, excuse, excuse me, Blair, the, the, the problem is we, mm -hmm. we can't hear you. So would you mind to 
Pips uh, join. Let's start all over again. <laughs> Good day, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. So uh, all I was adding is that the, the year started off extremely well for the port. Um, we'd just completed the Tifiti Wharf uh, investment and delivered that just under the bottom end of the uh, capital cost expectation. So we got off to a good start there and then the trade was actually flowing towards the top end of our profit outlook for the year. Uh, and then the cyclone had uh, came along and, and obviously substantially changed the, the landscape for the business. Uh, this year is our peak peak debt year, post the $170 million investment in the wharf. So, uh, so it's a year where we, we needed a good year and uh, we need to manage the affairs of the company tightly to ensure uh, that all the benefits of constructing the wharf uh, get, get uh, monetized going forward. So it's unfortunate that the trade volumes have dropped off the way they have. Um, that did have an effect on the ability to pay uh, the, uh, the June dividend at the rate that we would have liked. Um, and uh, in terms of the balance of the year, uh, I think there's some small signs now that the economy is just starting to remobilize, um, which is which is good. We've got a record cruise uh, season due to fire up in the uh, around October, November this year. It's going to be late this year. We've got 92 cruise ships booked in, uh, which is a record number, and it's in a compressed season. So. Uh, uh, that will be very welcome for the local economy and for the business. Uh, and the forestry sector is starting to show some signs of sort of getting back in check. The container trade for us is uh, still quite affected, particularly because Panpac's uh, out of action. Uh, that's our, our single largest um, cargo base uh, coming through the port. And, uh, and as everyone knows, they've been devastated by the uh, cyclone. So. Um, so there's going to be a little while for us to settle out and uh, get trade back to back to normal, um, uh, but we are starting to see some some sort of positive signs starting to come through uh, in the portfolio, and, and we'll be able to report more on that uh, and how material that is uh, as we head into our year end, which is uh, we're heading into our last week of our financial year uh, currently. So. Um, so we'll be able to come back out with some more updates on, on that year-end performance in due course. Um, we've also had uh, some positive uh, outcomes on insurance. So the port holds a comprehensive business interruption and material damage cover. Uh, and uh, we've had our first insurance payment for business interruption come through. So that's helping a little bit, but um, we're still incurring some of those losses. So. Uh, there's a timing issue around, you know, the recoveries that will come out of that, and it's not uh, definitive until you get the checks. So, uh, um, so some of the profit we would have made this year that may get covered in some way by insurance will probably fall into uh, into the following year uh, once we're in a position to claw it back. So, uh, so look, overall, not a, not a great year for the reasons everyone knows. Um, some, you know, I guess, some emerging. Slow signs of positivity uh, starting to come through, but we really need to get Panpac back online, get those cruise ships in, uh, and then you know next time I see you, we'll be able to give you a more comprehensive and, and up to date review. Thanks so much, Blair. Good to have you here. Any questions of um, Dan and on the report, to Councillor Harding? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I'm not sure, and thank you, gentlemen, for the, the presentation and all the data that comes with it. What I'm trying to do is understand in relation to our long-term planning process selves, the timing of the, the and the relative clarity that we may get to assess what income we might be able to receive from our investment, uh, particularly next year. And, and I'm thinking about peculiarities around insurance recoveries and business interruption, that sort of thing. So uh, just looking for the, the timing of at which you would give um, your, in, your your profit expectations for next financial year, please. Uh, so for the port, uh, we would normally issue uh, a guidance for a one-year period, and typically, that's typical of listed companies. They don't tend to predict too further ahead than that. Um, at the back end of this financial year, we'll need to evaluate our view around how much certainty we have around that. Uh, it's not good practice to disclose a profit range if you don't have sufficient certainty. So. A little bit like you, uh, the port needs to 
sort of consolidate its view with a view to whether we do issue guidance or not. It's not you know, guidance is a uh, an optional uh, part of running a listed company, uh, but it's obviously extremely helpful for all the obvious reasons. So. Uh, in the next couple of months, we're going to need to form a view as to whether we're in a position to issue guidance. Uh, and if we are, um, you know, that would be a decision we'd likely make this side of Christmas. So uh, uh, heading into the, you know, our first quarter of our new financial year. So, um, uh, so I hope to be in a better position to answer that question more accurately for you um, once we close out our current financial year and once we know a little bit more about our primary affected customers being Horticulture and, and PAMPAC will give us a much firmer steer on that. Okay, thank you. Can I just check my understanding, please, that the decision before the end of the year would be simply whether or not you are receiving, you know, going to issue some guidance, or if you're going to do it, and this is the guidance before that you would issue before Christmas. That's correct. And then uh, in December, where we do our presentation of our uh, financial year results, we need to make a decision on dividend for the interim uh, dividend as well. So, um, so this side of Christmas, I'd hope to be able to provide you some more clarity on where we stand, uh, and certainly as, as regards to dividend, you know, we will be issuing a position on that, which we will consider closer to the time. Thank you. Are there, are there any more questions that we might have? Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for coming along. And uh, yeah, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there a mover for that? I'm to move. Councillor Hollingsby, Councillor Harding. Yep. Those in favour, say aye. 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 No, thank you. Thank <coughs> you for coming in. Thank you so much. Um, Councillor Harding, would you mind taking the chair? I, I'm losing my vision. So. Oh, sure. <laughs> All those who agree, say aye. Thank you. Yep, we'll just finish aye. that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. So I get, okay, so back to item ten. Yep. Yeah. I didn't hear with me a second. Age break quarterly update. Is that what we had? That's what I've just done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, item nine, I think. We have two different versions of the numbering. All right, item eight. So item eight. In your report. No. We've done that one? Yep. So we're up to nine. Performance. Organisational performance report. Okay. And just let me get there. Okay. Okay. Hey, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> move back again. Um, yeah. I'll um, take the paper as read. Um, I usually have some points of interest in the quarterly report. Obviously, it's heavily um, describes the the cyclone after effects and the recovery as well. So we've put that in there in the executive summary. Um, but I'm just pointing out the number of Lagoima requests has jumped quite a lot this quarter, and we are seeing them in complexity, requiring more staff and resources to complete. So that's obviously a, a factor for um, staff. Um, we've got some new graphs in our customer customer experience team. We've been working behind the scenes as well, so about our daily feedback sentiment and also our response time for our customer inquiries, um, which is still quite um, uh, pleasing to see considering how many um, inquiries we've had over the last uh, um, few quarters as well. And the quarterly employee turnover has trended slightly downwards this quarter. Um, so the rolling 12-month turnover is down to 19.8% from 21.5% last quarter. Um, levels of service measures, you've just seen them in the annual report. I don't need to go through them. I, I will state that the next report that we um, we do, we'll probably go back to doing just exceptions reporting on there. At the moment, I've got everything in there um, for the new councillors, but we'll probably go back to ones that are not Mark Green uh, for the next report that, that we do. Um, and then just finally, activity reporting. Again, you'll probably see a lot more red than we usually have as well. So we've got 19 of our um, sort of 30 odd activities are off track from the usual work plans. Um, so this has been a result of staff working on uh, recovery and the resources to support the response and recovery. And there have been some pauses to business as usual as well. 
Um, and yeah, I think um, if there's any questions, um, you can fill them between myself or the general managers or uh, chair and um, uh, um, CEO. That would um, help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just need to check. Um, we have a quorum. We, mm -hmm. we with um, Pinawai back in the room. We may well do, but we, we're down one. We were a bit skinny. Um, Alison, can you help us there? Just just looking at it. Um, we, will, we will carry on. We'll, we'll, seven, we will discuss seven. the paper, um, but before, by the time we get to the to voting, we, we're good. Yep, yep. We're just, good. just, all right. Yeah. Just. No one else leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, do we have questions on the report? Please die. Yeah. Uh, die. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for your paper. Um, just a very quick question. The Lagoimas and their increasing volume, are they from a variety of inquirers or are they multiples from the same folk? Do you know? There's a, there's a mixture of the ones that I've, I've seen, um, Councillor mm -hmm. Roadley. So um, some people are um, consistent Lagoimas. Uh, and um, but we have seen an uptick as a result of of the cyclone. Um, so dealing with a lot of media type Lagoima um, and uh, providing data and information to those. So it's largely cyclone generated, but it's a it's a large range. Um, the size and scope of the Lagoima um, requests at the moment is is very extensive, um, given. Um, media interest in, in cyclone recovery and response. Sorry about that. <laughs> More questions? Everyone left the room, it was <laughs> So, uh, so Chair, I'm happy, happy to hand back to you. We've, we've had staff uh, present the paper. We've, we've had one question so far. Uh, and we are on uh, item nine, organisational performance report. Um, if I may, <laughs> I could, uh, a, a, a question or actually an observation. Um, look, I note there's a little bit of an inconsistency when it comes to, or it appears to me, when it comes to the, the status reporting and, 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 and the colouring of that. And uh, the scene, there, there were a couple of uh, inconsistencies I noted just in the terms of how how our um, Success or otherwise at achieving the measures is uh, is recorded. And one of those is, is around whether it is in relation to budget. So in, in some cases, underspend of budget is being treated as a as a uh, as a red, or as a as a failure, and in some cases, overspend of budget is treated as a failure. And so I, you know, it, it's not it's not helpful. I think if we can have a consistent standard there, that would be that would be better. And also, in some cases, um, where our failure to do something for, um, is treated as a as a um, there's an inconsistency about when we haven't done something that we intended to do, how that translates through to a school. So those are just two areas that leapt, leapt out at me. Can I make a comment about the financial? Because we we do have a standard for that. It's at, um, on page 25. Yep. Yeah, and it is under as well as over. So if you're underspent on your budget, is see is marked as red as well. And we we agreed on those um, like several years ago because underspend shows that you obviously you potentially might not be doing the work. Um, <coughs> We have been trying to, to get phasing in. Obviously, you're not always under, being underspent is not always a bad thing if you're plan, you know, it's loaded towards the end of the year as well. And I guess that's just as we develop our Tech One system and we have better phasing of our budgets, it should show whether we're on track or not as well. But uh, and, and in some cases, it does. But that's the reason we do market it red. So it's either within 10% or 30,000 under or over. We do market as red, and that's. If we if we do want to go back and change that, then it would be good to consistently apply it. Um, but if it's un if it's over budget and it's an income, obviously we mark that as green. Thank you. Just to comment through you, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, I think that might be worth having a look at because the if you've met the performance measures and the goals of the project and you've underspent it, that you want to reward that behaviour. 
if you haven't achieved the goals and you've underspent because you haven't done it, you don't. But um, uh, I, I think marking underspent as red when you've achieved the other goals is probably a bit perverse. So maybe we could take that offline and have a have a look at how we we do that. Any further, Councillor Hardy? No, thank you. Anything from the from the from the wall and die? No. Yeah, Dice had to go, so okay. I'm, I'm happy right. to uh, you want to move, move the recommendation. Yep. Uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, Councillor Ormsby will second that, I'm sure. Um, any comment from either of you? No. no. Anyone else? Comment? No? All good. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hey, thank you. Oh, See job well done. Um, oh, so I'll move the recommendation. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against will say no. That's carried. Um, I think, uh, where do we get up to, um, are we up to the tourism? Yes, we are. Yep, yep. Hawke's Bay Tourism Annual Report. Uh, and um, Andrew, you're going to regale us with this report? Yeah. Um, so the paper is, uh, uh, is simply a... Um, a, a report from um, Hawke's Bay Tourism that's been just um, transferred into our format. Um, procedurally, I'm not quite sure what to do here. Councillor Sears was going to speak to this paper, but has gone to the Civil Defence Committee and has left me with some comments um, that largely mirror what I would say anyway. So if I just launch into, into that. So, I mean, the key message is that uh, uh, it's... It has been a year of two halves. Um, things were looking good um, in the first half, um, and then uh, obviously cyclones hit with the with the resulting fifty million dollar uh, loss of spend that's estimated uh, in tourism. Other key figures: uh, tourism employs one in ten um, uh, people in Hawke's Bay, uh, employees in Hawke's Bay third highest contributor to GDP after processing and manufacturing. So it is a vital um, component of our economy. Another big highlight during the year was the, um, the great wine capitals, um, uh, the recognition of Hawke's Bay as one of the uh, wine capitals, uh, which has um, uh, generated uh, an estimated 1.6 million in advertising value um, and um, and that there is a, a, a degree of positivity coming into the the market now around the international visitor numbers summer book and the summer bookings that are coming through and we heard from uh, we heard from the port before about the uh, over 90 um, cruise ships coming through in a comp compressed season. Um, and yeah, key, key message um, that uh, tourism is a, is a key component of our economy and that the Hawke's Bay Tourism are very grateful for the Regional Council's support, um, both directly and as a, a um, channel to bring the um, funding in from the other uh, uh, territorial authorities. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any questions around the report that people want to raise? No? Yeah. Councillor Harding? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Look, I'm just uh, trying to uh, understand a gap in, in our understanding. So we're, we're investing 1.52 on, on behalf of the combined ratepayers of Hawke's Bay, $1.5 million a year into, um, the, into Hawke's Bay tourism. This annual report uh, demonstrates that and also some measures of performance, but we don't actually have a window into their overall financial performance. And I realise that, that we have Sophie Sears on the board and, and she is presumably privy to that, but on the face of things, that's a little bit of a gap in our understanding. 
If you remember, sorry, if I can answer that, um, uh, two months ago we actually had uh, Hamish and Alistair and his um, colleague, I'm so sorry, I can't remember, the purpose of that was to give a little bit of update on tourism, Hawke's Bay and what they had spent and sort of their direction and what they were working on. Uh, this, what is here today, is there's a requirement under the service level agreement or contractual funding agreement that they produce and confirm with us that they've met their KPIs uh, and so this is what this is and they should technically go together, uh, it's just they were separated, yeah, for, for whatever reason this year separated, yeah. Could, can you just remind me then um, what, whether that was, whether we got a balance sheet and a profit and loss with that or whether it was more highly... I cannot remember but I will follow that up and make sure that uh, this committee gets that. Thank you. Just one comment I'd make around um, the uh, cash investment coming in from um, uh, their, their supporters of being and, and membership uh, increasing to uh, 313,000, which is a, an excellent result. So they need some sort of commendation for for uh, the sector pulling together and contributing in that way. It's an excellent result. Thank you. I'll pass that back. Any other comments or questions? I have a mover for the report. Uh, Councillor McFoley, Councillor Harding. Uh, all those in favour of receiving the report say aye. Aye. Yes, we say no. That's carried. Thank you for that. Thank you, Andrew. Right. Uh, so we've gone through. Uh, <clears throat> we've done all of the information performance monitoring. Are we going in public excluded at this point? Is that where we're up to? Yeah. Um, so can I have a mover to go into public excluded, please? Okay. Uh, Councillor Ormsby, Councillor uh, Foley. Uh, all those in favour will say aye. Uh, against will say no. That's carried. We're now